All right, everybody. So now we're going to jump into photosynthesis. And I know that this is a little out of order from what the textbook has, um, but for some reason, AP has decided that photosynthesis should come before cellular respiration. It doesn't much matter. It is a cycle. Um, so we're just going to kind of learn how food essentially is made and then how it's broken down. And we already learned about enzymes, so we're going to learn roughly how they perform all of these functions in making that happen. So general background, photosynthesis in nature, plants and other autotrophs are the producers in the biosphere. What does that mean? Well, an autotroph is any organism that makes its own food. That's where the auto comes from. Um, and in this case, plants are the source or they produce the food because they are going to use sunlight to turn that into a chemical energy that then we can eat. So the special category that does that is called a photoautotroph. They use light to make their own food. Whereas us, for example, we can't do that. We are heterotrophs. We get food from another source. So hetero means different. So we can't use ourselves. We have to consume it from something else. Uh, here are just examples of what photoautotrophs could be. So this, you know, plants is one thing, but we also have algae, cyanobacteria, um, different kinds of other bacteria, and then protists as well. And you can see they're green, and we'll kind of get into why that is true later. Um, photosynthesis itself, as I mentioned, converts light energy into a chemical energy for food. So we talked previously about energy can be transferred. Um, the first law of thermodynamics is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only converted. So this is one example of where that can happen. Inside the cell where this does happen is the chloroplast. So that's what you're seeing here. Uh, it's one of the key organelles that we learned about via the endosymbiotic theory, for example. And it's got a double membrane and it's got the thylakoid discs that are kind of stacked like a roll of quarters and then the fluid inside the chloroplast is called the stroma so we're going to be hitting on these different parts as we go through because different elements of photosynthesis are happening there okay so here's just a picture of what chloroplasts look like in real life when you kind of zoom in on them okay so the site of photosynthesis is the chloroplast, yes, but where exactly in the plant is that? Well, chloroplasts are mainly found in the mesophyll cells. So this is like the tissue component of the leaf. And you can see kind of the cross section of what that looks like and all the chloroplasts lining that. Um, generally on the underside, not always, but usually on the underside of a leaf, are what are called stomata. So they are these little structures kind of right here on the bottom of the leaf, and they act as pores. So they are what open up traditionally in the uh, daytime, and they allow CO2 to go in because the plant is going to need that to then make glucose later on, and then that's also where oxygen leaves. That's also where water can kind of get in and out also. Uh, so a lot of water loss comes from water leaving through those as well. Chlorophyll is the green pigment that lives in the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. So they are kind of embedded in, and we will learn that pigments are the actual element that absorbs the photons of light from the sun that will fuel this pro photosynthesis process. Uh, the overall equation is up there. I think you've probably seen it before in your science life, but the idea is thinking about what a plant needs to survive. You need to give it water and you need to put it in the sun and it needs carbon dioxide because it takes in carbon dioxide and it gives us air, which is why plants are so important and we wouldn't be here without them because we need oxygen. So uh, the overall formula is carbon dioxide plus water plus light energy, so the sun, and that will then yield carbon, uh, excuse me, glucose, which is C6H12O6, and 
oxygen. This is a redox reaction, thinking back to chemistry, where I always remember it as oil rig. Uh, Leo goes Gur also works, but I always stick to oil rig. It has to do with electrons moving around. So oil means oxidation is losing electrons, which means that if something loses electrons, it becomes more positive. And rig is gaining electrons. So as you gain more electrons, you become more negative. In the process of this equation, electrons are transferred or they travel along with H plus. Um, and they go to carbon dioxide. And when they do that, then um, it'll be eventually transferred into a sugar and so on. So part of what this reaction is, is using the electrons from split water to make the reaction happen. We'll get into it more a little bit. Uh, you can track the atoms. That's kind of how they figured out what goes where. Uh, we don't really need to know the specifics about how researchers did it or what. It's more of an informational piece, but um, there was evidence that it comes from splitting water just based on where certain atoms went. So we knew carbon dioxide is involved, we know water is involved, and then just by the sheer amount of glucose that is made, you can kind of track where those things go. So when you split the water, the O eventually gets given off from the plant as oxygen. Some of it, um, the hydrogens go into making water later, um, and then some of them actually go into the making of the glucose. This is the overall photosynthesis reaction, and I think this is going to be a very good picture that you always seem to go back to as the baseline overview, what goes in, what comes out equation, because it can get kind of uh, super daunting in the nitty gritty if you really go into the intricacies of each step. Uh, photo means light and synthesis. Or, uh, means to make. So thinking about the way that photosynthesis is broken down into two reactions. We have the light reaction on the left, so that's where the photo part comes in. So photosynthesis has two parts, has the light reactions, which are really what are taking the light and converting it into uh, some ATP, as well as NADPH, which we will learn about in a little bit. Um, and then that's kind of harvesting the energy part. And then that energy is utilized in the second part called the Kelvin cycle, which is really where the synthesis is happening. And that's where things are being made. Okay, so now we're gonna kind of just go through the different reactions. The first one is the light reaction, and as I mentioned, we are going to convert solar energy into chemical energy, in this case ATP or NADPH. Oops, too far. Um, so the light is the energy part. Uh, sunlight in and of itself, just as a quick backstory, is electromagnetic radiation. And the idea is that if there's a shorter wavelength, um, also a higher frequency, that those are more high energy waves. Visible light is the part of the spectrum that we can actually see. Uh, light itself can be reflected, transmitted, or absorbed. So the, the spectrum of light that's absorbed is what the plant would be using to fuel photosynthesis. And then the light that's reflected and transmitted is what then we would see. Here's just a quick picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. You can kind of see that visible light is down at the bottom. So the really long wavelength or um, low frequency is red all the way to the um, short wavelength high frequency on the left. That's the, um, the violet and then it goes into kind of ultraviolet and gamma and so on. So there are certain frequencies that we will learn that are more advantageous for pigments to absorb light. Here it's just showing you what it looks like. Light hits the magical thylakoid part. Again, the chloroplasts live in the mesophyll part of the thylakoid membrane, so they're gonna be in there absorbing the light. Um, and some of that light, just naturally depending on what pigment it is, is gonna reflect certain colors and transmit certain colors. Those are the ones that we will visually see. Um, 
here are just a couple examples. So we have chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and carotenoids. There are more. There's xanophils and all kinds of stuff. But as an example, chlorophylls are highly prevalent. Uh, the chlorophyll A is kind of blue-green. In this case, chlorophyll B is kind of a yellow-green. And carotenoids are yellowish orange and what that means is those are the colors that they reflect and by having the ability of a plant to have these different pigments they can kind of available uh, availably absorb more wavelengths of light than if they just had one particular pigment it kind of gives them a broader spectrum which is more advantageous for survival if you don't know what your conditions are going to be there was an experiment and there are a couple of slides and they talk about it in your book about how this absorption spectrum was discovered it doesn't really matter if you know that just know that um, there's something called an absorption spectrum and it shows you what wavelengths of light are highly absorbed by certain pigments and this photo is kind of highlighting how they actually registered that and here's basically the result of that experiment. So there's wavelength along the bottom, as I said, uh, visible light is kind of sprawled out. And then there is absorption of light. And you can see that different pigments have a preference of what wavelengths they like to absorb. But you can generally see there's a lot of peaks in the blue purple range, and there are uh, a number of peaks in the red orange range. So those are actually the wavelengths of light that are most absorbed or most used, which logically speaking would then be the colors of light bulb that you might want in a grow light because those are the ones that the plant's going to be able to use the most. The lowest is really in the green range, which makes sense because most plants are green. The chlorophylls appear green because they are reflecting that color. And if they're reflecting that color, they can't absorb that light energy to do work. Uh, and that's why having a green light is probably not the best if you want your plant to survive. Here's just kind of another representation. Again, this highlights the specific experiment that was done, but you don't really need to know the logistics. Uh, here they had the spectrum and then the rate of photosynthesis, and you can see it doesn't really show you the range, but this would be in the purpley range and this would be in the red range. Similar down here, you can kind of see peaks in those regions. So those are going to be your more advantageous wavelengths of light for photosynthesis to happen. Okay, so now we are going to get into the nitty gritty of the actual lecture piece of light reactions and dark reactions, in this case, the Calvin cycle. Starting off, just know that we're going to get super specific, but I really care about you knowing more holistically what's happening. So the electrons in this case are excited by light. Light is energy. It is an energy wave. So the chlorophyll pigments absorb those photons of light, or at least the wavelengths that they do absorb, and it excites electrons. So you can see how they show excitement by it kind of shoots up into this excited state. And normally, then eventually they would calm down from their super excited state back to their happy, stable state. And if they did that, then they would be giving that energy off as heat or light. Uh, this vial here is actually showing you what that light would actually look like. Uh, this is kind of concentrated chlorophyll in the absence of anything else. And you can see what that would be because there's no place for those electrons to go in this isolated system. But in an actual plant, they do go somewhere. So that's not really what happens, but it gives you an idea. The electrons get really excited and they get energized. The place where this happens is a reaction center. So they're called photosystems and plants have photosystem one and two, but in the order that they were discovered, uh, it turns out that photosystem two actually becomes before photosystem one, but the principle is the same. There is a reaction center. So the reaction center is kind of like that middle part and there is a light harvesting complex. So those surround 
the reaction center complex. The light harvesting complex are pigments, where so that's where all the chlorophylls are hanging out, and proteins as well. And the idea is when photons of light hit those pigments in the light harvesting complex, they can harvest the light energy or those really excited electrons can kind of bounce around and they eventually make their way to a special pair of chlorophyll molecules that are located in the reaction center. Uh, the light harvesting complexes themselves are kind of acting like an antenna. They um, funnel all of those electrons into the reaction center and then they make their way eventually when they all get really really excited to this primary electron acceptor. So when this electron acceptor takes on all of these electrons, it's essentially reducing, because rig, think oil rig, uh, rig means reduction is gaining, that primary electron acceptor gets reduced. So we're going to kind of learn more about where those go in a minute, but the idea is there are two special photosystems. They each kind of have a little bit unique properties, but it's kind of the same deal. They are going to work together to make ATP and NADPH that will eventually become food. Um, in terms of where electrons go once they've reached that primary electron acceptor, I'm going to walk you through the word version and then we'll get to the picture version and I think it'll be a little bit easier for you. But there's a linear flow and there's also what we'll call a cyclic flow, which we'll mention briefly. So the electron flow, I'm going to put all this up here and then kind of talk about it. So chlorophyll, the pigment, gets excited by the light photons hitting the pigments and those electrons get really excited and kind of move up and are passed along. Again, photosystem two happens before photosystem one. And those excited electrons make their way eventually to the primary electron acceptor. And what that does is it causes a redox reaction. That electron acceptor gets reduced and electrons will become transferred. And when that happens, it kind of keeps those electrons from naturally falling back down to a ground state, like we had seen before in isolation. So that way, those electrons right now have the potential to do all kinds of work. But this doesn't just happen. Like those electrons have to really come um, from somewhere in the sense of you need to replace the ones that you use. So this is where water comes in. Water is split in order to replace the electrons that were lost. Um, in this case, thinking about how the water is split and where it goes, it's split into two H's that will eventually get pumped into the thylakoid space and will make sense later why. But those hydrogens leave into the thylakoid space, which is kind of the, if you're thinking about the thylakoid as a a quarter, it's in the interior of the quarter. It's in it's inside the thylakoid itself. Um, the electrons themselves go to that electron acceptor and the oxygen will eventually leave the cell as the air that we then breathe. So hydrogens are going to be used for a concentration gradient later. The electrons are going to the electron acceptor and the oxygen is going to be given off. The electrons from that excited state and that primary electron acceptor, they get passed from photosystem two to photosystem one. And this magic happens via an electron transport chain. Uh, because the book goes a little bit out of order, you also learn about the electron transport chain in the cellular respiration chapter. But for now, just understand that an electron transport chain is a series of electron acceptors that the electrons kind of hop down. They slowly but surely fall down in energy gradient. Instead of like one big burst, it basically helps make it happen in a stepwise fashion. And because it's slowly moving down to a more stable energy level, this is an exergonic thing. It's giving off energy and spontaneous. Um, and that energy that's given off is really providing the necessary energy for ATP synthesis. To happen. Um, and when that does, the idea is that 
more hydrogens are going to be pumped into that thylakoid space, which is already high anyway from before. And that's what's going to be able to fuel the eventual production of ATP. Or excuse me, not ATP, but also going to fuel the production of glucose. Uh, let's see. ATP gets produced by photophosphorylation, which I'll show you in the picture in a moment. The electrons that came from photosystem one, uh, primary electron acceptor, go through a second electron transport chain, and that creates something called NADPH. So there's roughly two electron transport chains. Again, with words it's confusing, I will show you the picture in a minute, but the overall main idea that you need to take away is that the light reactions use solar energy to create ATP and NADPH. NADPH is also an energy source or an energy carrier or holder. And that, that is what is going to provide the necessary energy to drive the making of glucose. Here's the general gist of what is going on in the picture. Um, photosystem two is on the left, and you can kind of see, first we have light hitting these pigments, or the chlorophyll molecules, and then it is exciting electrons. Those excited electrons are transferred over to the special chlorophyll A molecules that are pre present in the uh, complex in the center and there's a special one for photosystem two there's a special one for photosystem one they are called that just based on their optimal wavelength so there's p680 p700 you don't need to know that but the idea is then all of those really excited electrons go to a primary electron acceptor and water ends up getting split in this process so that it can replace those electrons that the special pair lost. So when it gives up its electrons to the primary electron acceptor, they need to be replaced. So that's where the splitting of water comes in. And in that process, um, oxygen is given off, and then the two H's that are generated are going to be used later, uh, but for now pumped into the thylakoid uh, space. Uh, the electrons that leave here go down an electron transport chain. So they're kind of going down. You can see they go stepwise down. During that process, some ATP is made, and we will come back to that. That's where those hydrogen ions from before are going to be used to generate ATP. But the electrons are going to hop down to the next special chlorophyll molecules and get excited again to that primary electron acceptor. And they're going to slowly work down the chain. Um, an electron transport chain, and that electrons are going to be used to make NADPH. Again, this is another slightly less powerful holder of energy, but NADPH works well for photosynthesis. And then that can then go to the second part. Here's just a general picture of what it looks like too. Um, you hit photosystem two with a photon, it excites some electrons, and now they have some potential to do work because they're highly energized and unstable. They slowly work their way down an electron transport chain while some ATP is being made. And then another light source ignites or uh, elevates the energy of that electron, and then it can be transferred over to NADPH, which still holds a lot of potential to do work. Uh, not really mentioned in your book, but just as an add-on, there is a cyclical electron flow too. We mostly talk about just the linear, and that's what we're going to move on straight forward from here. But just know there is the opportunity of this cyclical process of when the things go from photosystem 2 to photosystem 1, that when they get excited, the electrons get excited, instead of continuing to make NADPH, they actually just kind of cycle back. And that energy is used to fuel the production of more ATP. So the idea is you're just making as much ATP as you can strictly for the Kelvin cycle to be able to generate more glucose. So that's where the cyclic flow comes in. Some of it is used to make NADPH, which is an energy molecule, just not quite as strong as ATP. And some of it goes to make more ATP.
Okay. So, chemiosmosis. So this is just the movement of chemicals, essentially. In our instance, we are talking about H plus, protons moving. Both mitochondria during respiration and chloroplast during photosynthesis do this. This is the primary way with which ATP is actually made. And we will learn this again in respiration. They show you a side by side here, so you can kind of see um, in the chloroplast, which is what we're talking about now, there's the thylakoid space, which is the interior part. There is the stroma, which is the outside part. And thanks to the hydrogens from water splitting being high in the thylakoid space um, and kind of being pumped in there also from the electron transport chain, there's a high concentration on the inside and low on the outside. So what happens is it's gonna slowly diffuse its way through the ATP synthase pump um, and during that process, it's going to use that energy to attach phosphates onto ADP and make ATP. Uh, so that just happens by diffusion of the protons going from the high concentration gradient down through the low concentration gradient. And here's what that looks like. So. Some of those hydrogens that made the gradient come from water. Some of them are pumped across the membrane by cytochrome. So in the electron transport chain part, some of them get pumped in. And when NADP plus is reduced, meaning that it gains an electron, um, it picks up an H plus. It picks up two electrons actually. Um, it becomes reduced in that process. It's basically sucking the H to do that from the stroma. So by doing that, you are again reducing the H out here and increasing that concentration gradient. So all three of these things that are listed here are really exaggerating the chemical gradient of hydrogens on the inside versus the outside. And that is all used to then fuel the diffusion of them, you can see here, through the ATP synthase and the production of ATP. And then that ATP can move on to the second part along with the NADPH to the Calvin cycle, which is where we are headed next. That is the second half, and I know this is not the most enthralling thing in the world, but here we go. The Calvin cycle. We've made the energy. Great. The plant has ATP. The plant has NADPH. Right now, it has no food. So, what needs to happen is that energy needs to be used with carbon dioxide because again a plant needs that but we haven't really used it yet and it's going to use the carbon in carbon dioxide to really make a sugar um, there are three phases that we will learn about um, the sugar that is generated here is going to be a three carbon sugar we pop out at the end with g3p um, and I'll explain kind of where that comes from. But the thing to know too is that the Calvin cycle is actually going to be three turns of the cycle. There are three carbon dioxide molecules that are going to be incorporated. So this whole thing kind of cranks around three times. And within that, as it's going around, the three key steps are carbon fixation, reduction, and then you need to regenerate something called... Um, RUBP, or in this case, you could just call it um, rubulose bisphosphate, if that's what you would rather call it. Walking through those steps, the first one, as I mentioned, is you have three carbon dioxide molecules, and they need to enter one at a time. So that's why I mentioned that it kind of goes around three times. So what happens is there's a magical enzyme that's probably the most abundant enzyme in the whole world. It's called Rubisco. So sorry, it doesn't end in ACE. It technically does if you go with its full name of RUBP carboxylase. Um, but what it ends up doing is it takes that carbon dioxide and it fixes it um, to a three carbon compound. Excuse me, I misspoke. It attaches it to a five carbon compound. Good grief. It is late, everyone. <laughs> um, so the carbon dioxide gets attached to a five carbon sugar called 
ribulose bisphosphate, RUBP. And that is something that is in the cell already and gets regenerated after every cycle. And when you do that, you have a five carbon, you stick on the carbon dioxide, great. Now you have a six carbon compound, but it's super unstable. So it immediately breaks itself down and becomes two, three carbon compounds that we will kind of get to later in a little bit. Um, it shows you kind of here that it's a short-lived intermediate. Now we have three carbons in a row. And eventually, once phase two is done, then we will go and eventually make one G3P, one singular three carbon sugar output that can be used to make glucose. And that's really one per kind of turn of the cycle. Uh, phase two is reduction, and you can kind of see what's happening here, maybe a little bit. Reduction is gaining electrons, so that's kind of happening overall, but the idea, just know that ATP and NADPH, those things that were made in photosystem one, are now being you, excuse, photosystem two, now that we are in photosystem one, good grief. Uh, those are being used to fuel this part of the Calvin cycle. So they were made in photosystem two as a result of the light reactions. Now they are here. They are being used up in the reduction portion of the Calvin cycle to generate that G3P molecule. The final stage is the need to regenerate the ribulose bisphosphate, the RUBP, because that is the carbon acceptor. That is the thing that will fix the carbon dioxide that comes into the plant. So it needs to be remade. So overall, if you can see, um, this cycle makes one usable three carbon sugar, but we had a whole lot more carbons to start off with. And you can see that five three carbon sugar. So most of it has to actually go back into the regeneration process. So somehow by some rearranging of molecules, those five three, uh, G3P molecules with three ATP actually are used to make and remake the RUBP molecules that are necessary to crank this thing around three more times for the next sugar molecule it needs to make. I know this seems complicated. You don't need to know every single subset, just general, what goes in, what goes out, and we'll review in a minute. Um, what's important to note is that at the very end of the chapter, it really talks about how plants have adapted this system and it's changed over time a little bit because there's something called photorespiration. And the idea here is that Rubisco, that super amazing um, enzyme, can actually fix and bind oxygen as well as carbon dioxide. So in a perfect world, a plant is binding carbon dioxide. They are then using that to make sugar. But it's also possible that it binds oxygen. And oxygen is what we use when we do cellular respiration. Plants do cellular respiration too. They can make food, but great, they have food. They actually need to use it too. So what ha ends up happening is that they use that rubisco molecule to bind oxygen instead of carbon dioxide. And this overall process actually uses up ATP and it doesn't even make any sugars. Instead, it ends up not creating anything that it needs to make. It just uses up ATP and has no end product. Why could this possibly be? Well, it's thought that it's kind of evolutionary baggage, so to speak. In the great world of the atmosphere that came before us, there was a lot less oxygen. So it, there wasn't really the need to prevent binding it because there was just so much carbon dioxide in the air. But now that's not really so true. So because of that, um, 
it's thought that plants just haven't had that selection pressure to not have that be a thing. So what's the overall problem? Well, these are called C3 plants. And the reason that they're called C3 plants is that they bind three carbon compounds um, in the Calvin cycle. Things like this include rice and wheat and soybeans. Uh, they partially close their stromata where the gas exchange takes place. They do that at nighttime. Um, but when they close their stomata, well, then that means no more CO2 is really coming in. And if they don't have CO2, then they can't fix it and make, or make glucose from photosynthesis. So what ends up happening is if there's low CO2, then it's going to use available oxygen around and photorespiration will take place. Overall, you're kind of decreasing your efficiency. You're not making as much glucose as you should. You are wasting ATP, no sugars being made, all of that business. So some plants have kind of evolved a way around that, and those are called C4 plants. So instead of being fixed to a three carbon sugar like traditional plants are, they are bound to a four carbon compound. Things like this include um, corn, sugarcane, grass. So what ends up happening on a hot, dry day is the stomata close. And inside the plant tissue are cell types called mesophyll, which we talked about before where all the chloroplasts live. And there's also something called a bundle sheath cell. And the idea here is that the enzymes in the mesophyll have a super high affinity for carbon dioxide. So they, they really love carbon dioxide. And so they bind it even when the concentration is low. So if the stomata has been closed and there's not a whole lot of carbon dioxide around, it doesn't really matter. The enzyme still has a super high affinity for it. So it's going to kind of seek it out. And then it can shuttle it to the second type, this bundle sheath cell to release. And you're kind of making this little micro environment that has a lot of CO2, even though the overall conditions don't have a lot of CO2. And when you do that, it can kind of keep going on the Kelvin cycle because of the availability of the CO2. So even in the presence of low concentration, they can still be making more. And here you can kind of see what that leaf anatomy looks like. If you so choose, we are not going into the intricacies of this at all. The last type of plant I want to talk about is called a cam plant, and it's called this from the uh, Crassulacean acid metabolism, or cam. The idea here is a little bit strange. So normally plants have their stomata open during the daytime when they can do the light reactions and then follow up with the Calvin cycle. In this case, their stomata are open at night, which is kind of weird because if there's no light, then no light reactions can take place. So what ends up happening is at nighttime in these plants, carbon dioxide enters, and then they actually attach to organic acids and compounds and vacuoles. The plant essentially stores the CO2 to use later until morning when eventually, uh, when light comes out, the stomata close. So right, light reactions will start to take place and the, the cell itself can use its stored CO2 to make this overall reaction happen. So the light reactions during the daytime will supply the necessary energy and the cells itself stored the carbon dioxide from the night before, and that's what will then fuel the Calvin cycle. So a lot of cacti do this, succulents, pineapples do this. Pretty much the things that need to store water would also be good at storing carbon dioxide. Okay, so this just highlights what the C3 plants would be. Um, in the sense, this is the typical Calvin cycle that we know about. Three carbon dioxides come in, they get fixed and generate three carbon sugars, and those will then be eventually made into glucose. Um, six ATPs 
plus another three ATPs, nine total ATPs go into this thing to make it happen, six total NADPHs, all in the livelihood of generating one G3P molecule. Um, C4 in CAM plants do it a little bit differently so that they don't have to worry so much about um, the loss of carbon dioxide. This compares what they look like. C3 plants, the one that we really knew about with the special enzyme of Rubisco. The other ones have their own special, um, or excuse me, yeah, uh, their own special enzymes that do their own thing and fix it to a three carbon or a four carbon or specific organic molecules, that kind of thing. I don't think I need to highlight this, but clearly photosynthesis is super important. And the last few slides are just a review. So again, this is, I think, the super important picture. It highlights everything and kind of puts it into perspective. Photosynthesis is two halves, photosystem two and photosystem one. Light hits the chlorophyll pigments in photosystem two. Water is split to provide electrons for that. Overall, electrons get really excited. They move down an electron transport chain to photosystem one, where they can become excited again, and then move down a second transport chain. After photosystem two, ATP is made. After photosystem one, NADPH is made. Both of those are sources of energy that will fuel the process of the Kelvin cycle. In the splitting of water, the hydrogens are used to create a gradient that will make ATP through the ATP synthase. The oxygens will then move their way out and create oxygen, and then again the electrons are used to make the energy as well. In the second part, these are called the dark reactions or the Kelvin reactions because they are light independent. This is where carbon dioxide comes in, and it gets fixed um, to uh, RUBP by Rubisco, and then eventually you generate a three carbon sugar G3P. And then you need to recycle or put in energy to recycle that RUBP to happen again. There are three carbon dioxide molecules, so this thing cranks around three times, and then you can eventually create and make carbohydrate or glucose molecules from that, or even more complicated uh, sucrose molecules, and so on. This is a web chart that basically goes through all of those things. So you can kind of see how it's put together. If you're more of a word map person, this might be a good review slide for you. Uh, comparison, we have not gotten into the intricacies of respiration yet, but you can kind of get a gist for it on the left. Photosynthesis, we've talked extensively about at this point, so it's on the right. This is a review of the light reactions. And then lastly, the review of the Kelvin cycle, just to give you an overall idea of what's going on. And that finally concludes photosynthesis.